Mario Andreas Robinson was born in Altus, Oklahoma, where he resided with his family before relocating to New Jersey at the age of 12. His artistic gift was discovered by a fifth grade teacher and a creative explosion was sparked in the preteen. Robinson studied at the prestigious Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. Early in his development, Mario began looking to the great masters for inspiration and technical insight. An avid student of realism, he studied the elemental principles of painting by exploring the work and technique of old masters such as Rembrandt, Vermeer, and Degas. However, it was in the work of 19th and 20th century American artists that provided Robinson with the strongest stylistic foundation, helping him forge and define his own artistic sensibility. The work of Mario Andreas Robinson fits squarely within the tradition of American painting. Robinson's finished works bear a close affinity to the masters of the realist tradition, such as Andrew Wyeth and Thomas Aikens. Containing few references to modern life, Robinson's work has a timeless and universal quality and exhibits a distinct turn of the century stylistic aesthetic. The images he chooses, which refer to a bygone era where solitude and reflection were abundant, also provoke frequent conversations and allusions to the paintings of Winslow Homer and Edward Hopper. Beginning in 1994, Robinson's work began to extensively incorporate rural subjects primarily located in the state of Alabama. Each subject is very personal for the artist in both selection and execution. As the work progresses, his relationship with the sitter develops and a uniquely personal story begins to evolve. Robinson's frequently uh, depicts subjects framed within the context of their daily lives. The underlying narrative counters sentimentality and serves as the underpinning for his figurative images. Mary Robinson is also the author of Lessons in Realistic Watercolor on the Monticelli Press, distributed by Penguin Random House. And finally, Mario is an exhibiting artist member, EAM, of the National Arts Club an artist member of the Sal Magundi Club in New York, and a signature member of the Pastel Society of America. His work has been featured several times in the Artist Magazine, the Pastel Journal, Watercolor Magic, American Art Collector, Fine Art Connoisseur, and on the cover of American Artist Magazine. In February 2006, in the issue of the Artist Magazine, Mary was selected as one of the top realists, the top 20 realists under the age of 40. Robinson's work is widely collected by private and public collectors. Mary, I want to thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to listen to what you have to say and look at your images with great interest. And I'm going to slip away in the background and hand the floor over to you. Go right ahead, my friend. Thank you so much, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank you before you take off for um, having me. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to share my work. So I'm gonna begin with, let's see. Okay, sorry about that mix up. Um, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. I'm going to um, kind of start at the beginning of my career, not bore you too much with a lot of details, but I wanna bring us backwards so we can go forward. So as, uh, Dan mentioned I'm Mario Robinson, and I've been a professional artist now for uh, going on 27 years uh, straight. I started my career in 1994, um, and I started, I hit the ground running right out of graduating from Pratt Institute in 1994. Um, I initially wanted to go straight to art school from high school, but my mother, being a disciplinarian, she was, and the realist in the real world, uh, let me know that I needed to get um, some kind of a trade before going to art school. So I went into uh, the Army uh, right out of high school and got the GI Bill. And after the Army, I went to art school, went to Pratt Institute. Um, and that's where I started really getting interested in the American masters and um, oil painting and realism. So I'm gonna start with um, some of my first models that I met in Huntsville, Alabama. This gentleman here is one of the first models that I got on my own after I really um, started looking at people in Alabama. 
uh, when my mom moved there with her job in 1994. And it just reminded me of a bygone era and the era um, in which I grew up in, in Oklahoma. And I met a lot of people that were um, very simple and not simple as far as um, intellect or education, but their daily practices and, and their rituals and the things that they cared about and loved. And they kind of matched a lot of my ideals. Uh, so this gentleman's name is Oscar. And I was introduced to him by one of my friends. And at that time, I was a young artist um, struggling to make ends meet. And I was always looking for new models and people would come up freely um, and kind of suggest people to me. And, you know, a lot of times it didn't work out, but in this, this particular instance, um, they shot some Polaroids of Oscar and uh, did this drawing of him. And then I got so obsessed with, with him as a figure, I went back and uh, created a painting of him. So this, this vantage point is, um, he has the, a porch, it's an elevated porch and I'm down um, off to the side. And this particular day I came over to paint him and found out that he had chemotherapy and it shaved all of his, all of his hair off and he was jittery. And I, I just didn't know if I could continue with the session, but he really journeyed on and um, imposed for me. And then he passed away a few years later. So I just um, became really interested in older people um, in the beginning of my career. Um, it really set off a lot of ideas about my family members and um, mortality and how um, important relationships are, you know, because when they're gone, they're gone. So this is Oscar Wesley. And this is from the same period. This is my actually my first model that I ever got on my own out of art school. Um, I met Plum um, through my mom and Plum and my, her, her mom, Marcy was my mom's best friend. And um, Plum was visiting the house one day and she had this dress on and heels and she was wearing these, these clothes to school. And I just, I was fascinated um, because, you know, for someone to dress like this, um, and at this point it was 1996, um, I just really loved that, that her mom took that, took that care. Um, so this is behind the, uh, the apartment where my, mo my mother was living. Um, and at this time I was doing pastels. So you can kind of see the cross-hatching technique I was using, especially in the, in the right side of, uh, in the top of the composition, you can see uh, that heavy, heavy cross ha uh, hatching that I was doing at the time. And this is on watercolor paper. And even in this time, I was trying to kind of mimic um, the light that watercolor kind of gives you, um, but I couldn't really understand the medium yet. So I just kept doing these pastels and trying to make them look as, uh, as washy and, and bright as I possibly could. Moving on, this is the same model. So I painted Plum uh, from 1996 to approximately uh, two, 2008. Um, so this is this is a big pastel I did. This is the last of a series. I did about 30 paintings of her. And this is her graduating from high school and letting me know that it was gonna be the end of um, her time posing for me. She was getting older and I was putting her in these 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 dresses that I was getting from the uh, the Army Navy sh uh, the, uh, the thrift shop, and uh, she she just let me know that it was time to move on. So this is the last um, painting I I did of of Plum, and this is a, one of those big pastels. So this gentleman is is this was an accident. I was actually in Charleston to paint. Um, a famous blacksmith um, named Philip Simmons. And he had won um, awards from several presidents. Um, and uh, he was just famous in the area and he was running late for the session. So this gentleman was guarding the, uh, the garage area where Philip Simmons' studio was. And um, I was waiting for about an hour actually for him and this gentleman just stood in front of in front of the, the studio and would not move. So I actually ended up getting more excited by him 
than I did Mr. Simmons because this gentleman had just a weird uh, way of being in the world. And you can see this light um, releasing those beautiful tones in his face, um, almost irresistible. So I did it. I actually did a sketch on the site um, and then came back and he actually posed for me. And it turned out to be a really nice uh, person. He was an apprentice for Mr. Simmons. And I just love these personal uh, stories, these narratives, um, because when I paint people, I, I really have to have a connection. I have to have something uh, that gets me inspired, that gets me going uh, when it comes to, to humans and uh, the architecture and the other places that I've painted. There has to be some kind of memory or personal connection uh, to the people that I, that I paint. So this gentleman I met uh, uh, in on this and he was, when I passed him, um, he looked like a very interesting uh, person, obviously with the, with the beard and uh, the Bible. And um, the person I was with was like, jokingly, that, that person looks like he could be in one of your paintings. And I, I just blew it off. And I thought about it as we walked around. Um, so then I went back to that very church and he was gone. And sure enough, he was walking um, uh, on the sidewalk. And I ran up to him and, and asked him, you know, would he, would he pose for me? And he said, if you get me a hot dog with, with chili on it. Um, I said, of, of course. Um, and he tried to tell me he was a, a traveling evangelist and, and all this other stuff. And it turns out he was a homeless gentleman. So I did get him the hot dog and he posed. And you can see that if you look above his lip, you can see the brown kind of stain in his beard. He, I mean, he, I think he swallowed it whole. It was, it was just amazing uh, how quick he ate it. But I love um, the dignity that he had. You know, he, he, he really was trying to cover and mask the fact that he was, he was homeless and he got kicked off the steps of the, of the church uh, of all places. But um, I call this one uh, the Baptist because he told me he was a Baptist minister. And this is around 2004. And this is the piece that ended up on the cover of the artist um, magazine. And it was just around the time when I was trying to transition out of um, pastel to watercolor. So I had been doing watercolors for, at this time, privately on my own, just in secret, trying to work out some of uh, the issues uh, for about a year at this point. I started in maybe around 2003 uh, painting watercolors. So this is an, an example um, of me merging uh, those two worlds together. So this is watercolor and pastel on paper. So you can see uh, on the left side, the wash that I applied all the way over um, and covered it with, with cross hatching in certain areas. Um, and I blocked in the, the jean shirt with watercolor, I blocked in the hat and you can see uh, how I came back around on the right side with the, in the shadow area and underneath uh, with, the, uh, with the pastel over it. And then the speckled uh, sunlight on her face is all watercolor. And then kind of coming in with those darker areas, those warmer passages um, to give it a little bit of body. And I was trying to learn um, how to merge the two together, but they really don't play well together because the pastel is such a heavy medium that um, it kind of overtakes the washy kind of flimsier areas of, of the watercolor. So I had to kind of stop telling myself that I was gonna do this style and just uh, work a little bit harder to, to learn the, uh, the medium of watercolor. This is another example. Um, this is approximately 2004. Um, that I had a watercolor wash underneath this. And you can see these shimmering lights, like this is my grandfather. So my grandfather's um, forehead and, and the white of his hair up top, you can see how, how high the key is. Um, and that's all the watercolor, kind of the way watercolor works around a, a figure and kind of leaves really high um, highlights. Um, and then I, I just basically started just scrubbing in with the pastel to see how the two of them can play in the midtones, then ultimately just douse it with the uh, 
going really hard with the with the pastel in the shadow of the of the, uh, of the t-shirt and and I started to really get get my bearings when it came to um, to watercolor so underneath all of this is a little bit more of a comprehensive watercolor living under there and I think that lends um, itself to the to the realism where the pastel comes in and takes advantage of a little bit of that infrastructure that's left underneath. And this is my grandfather. I only met my grandfather two times in my life. So this is the second time and it's the last time I ever met him. So I kind of like this this kind of kind of heavenly light pressing down um, above uh, on his on his head. I didn't plan it, but every time I look at it, um, I kind of have that feeling. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my grandpa. So this is yet another example of the watercolor working with pastel. Um, and you can see the white, the pastel kind of kind of sets up for I mean the watercolor sets up for the pastel here. Um, so I washed in the background, um, washed in the jacket and the shirt, and told myself that I was really gonna leave this. Um, this really high uh, color key, and then just work in the face. And this is one of the first examples of me knocking in a, a monochromatic block in where the face has these, um, these value progressions in gray and the hair, you can see the hair obviously has the gray. And I was starting to figure out how to maintain, how to control the values of watercolor and I didn't really have to use that much pastel in this one. So with each one of these hybrids, um, I was able to get closer and closer to getting better at watercolor, really kind of hiding in plain sight while I was putting pastel, um, which I was known for at the time, over top of the watercolors. So this gentleman's name is uh, Charles Jones, and he was a bartender for me at one of my um, openings in Charleston at a gallery. And when I came up the sidewalk, he was, he had a door open uh, to the gallery, almost, almost like an angel ushering me in. I, I just remember um, thinking to myself, um, I've never seen a jacket that white before. And um, he was just the kindest individual that I've ever met. And every time people comment on this, this painting, they think he's a doctor or, or something like that. And lo and behold, he's, he's a bartender. Um, with just a beautiful, most beautiful understated voice. And I've never seen him without a, a smile on his face. So this, this is around 2005 when I just totally gave up and committed and um, started doing watercolor uh, for most of my paintings. So you can see now, this is what was underneath, very close to, the, uh, the level that was underneath all of those pastels that I just showed. And now I'm starting to come out with it a little bit more and calling the galleries and telling them, I'm, telling them that I'm gonna commit to watercolor. And you know, that, that didn't go over really that well. And uh, sure enough, I put together about 15 or 16 uh, watercolors together for Anne Long Fine Art in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And we had a sold out show. We sold 13 before the show even opened. And then we sold the other three at the show. So I, I had been doing this um, underneath the pastels for at least three years before I kind of unveiled it and came out with it. So you can see the, the architecture, you can see how much um, of the monochromatic block in that I'm putting underneath it in the shirt, I'm putting in the background, the sky, and then I'm going in with the figure and that's all living under there. So I've figured out how to control a little bit of the chroma um, and how warm and how cool everything was based on the block in. So I'm still learning on the job. So these two figures, these two subjects are, are the same subject. This is my father. I mean, my father have kind of like this tumultuous kind of, um, we, we really don't, we're still learning each other because I met my dad when I was 27 years old. Um, so I would go down uh, to Oklahoma and paint him 
So this wheat field is actually a place where I used to cut through um, the field to uh, go to grade school in Oklahoma. And he lived maybe two blocks from there, but we still, um, we, we didn't know each other. So I took him back to that place and kind of re, I just wanted to reintroduce him and me to, to that field and see what, what emotions uh, were still there. So this is my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother has an interesting story as well. Um, she was maybe in her mid thirties when one of her ex-boyfriends um, came into the bar and, and shot her in the head. Um, and uh, she ended up being paralyzed um, and lost, lost her ability. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, so she lost her ability to use her legs and was paralyzed on the left side um, when she was in her mid thirties. So um, I would go back to the, to the nursing home and visit her and draw her and paint her. And one day I, I went to her closet to clean, clean her closet out and she had this fur. And I said, grandma, I never even see you outside. <laughs> never even seen you outside. She's like, well, I wear this to church to the chapel in the church of the nursing home. Um, and this is one of the last paintings I did uh, of my grandmother. And this is 2006. So this is my, uh, this is my Aunt Dolores. And um, this is when I was really comfortable, starting to really get comfortable with the watercolor in 2007. Uh, and the background is, is a local church where we all congregated and it was kind of like a meeting up place. It was a church. It was kind of like a social club. And um, this was Easter Sunday and she hated her profile. So what did I do? I just told her just kind of trust me and uh, painted her in profile. So this is Aunt Dolores. So this gentleman uh, I was, again, I was driving with my sister and she looked to the side and said, this, this, this man looks like he could be in one of your paintings. He's just sitting there um, enjoying the day. And sure enough, we turned the car around and went and got uh, my uh, materials. And he sat there and my favorite part about this painting uh, is the, the reflections uh, of the big feel he was, he was sitting there and, and staring at. Um, and I, I sat there for hours and um, he, told, he told me he had a tire service and not one person showed up in those hours. And I just love um, just the easy way that people have in the South where, you know, he's got this broken computer desk chair, um, relaxed. He really didn't have to do too much for this pose because this is literally how I walked up on him. Uh, so this is, this is Leslie. Leon rather. So this is the husband to my Aunt Dolores that I showed earlier. Um, and I'm really proud of, of um, him because when we were growing up, he was he had issues with, with alcohol and we would always go to church and leave him behind. Um, and then later on in life, he got everything together and he began became a, a trustee and usher um, and Uncle Clyde, I was really proud of him. He, he retired as a sanitation worker, really hard worker, um, really good man, and really straightened everything out at the end. Uh, so this is, again, that same Easter Sunday where I kind of grabbed the two of them and wanted to, to honor them in this way. Again, this, this is all centered around that same church and I actually lived behind this church so I spent a lot of time staring at it and looking at it and being inside of it so I'm taking all of these characters that I know and love and appreciate um, and just really sharing that ritual of all of us meeting up at the church and being there and you know having Christmas plays there and it, it was a really big part of my childhood uh, this place was bigger than life to me uh, so this is one of the gentlemen that used to uh used to babysit us and one one day he was just coming out of the, the church and I was down at the bottom of the stairs and he looked like a giant to me 
Um, and I just love that white shirt when you come out into that sun and everything is, is, is just shining. And um, he, he's just a, a really lovely person. I, and I really think this captures his, his personality. So this is Ella. Ella lives across the street from the church. Um, and she was a, a watercolorist and she painted florals. And you can see how she uh, put one of her flowers from her garden in her hat. Um, and she, she was just a wonderful supportive person when I was growing up. And she always encouraged me to do my art and just keep going and do it as much as you possibly can with it. And she was a huge inspiration to me. And I, I love the, ref the reflection. I put my reflection uh, in the left side of her, uh, her sunglasses there. And these people are just the absolute salt of the, salt of the earth and the reason why I'm actually um, the person I am today. So it makes me feel good to be able to honor them and, and paint them and share them with, with you all and others. So this is, again, this is plum and watercolor. And so with watercolor, you know, you can take advantage of, of, of the white of the paper and, and just try to go as delicately around it as, as possible. And this is, this is just really an exercise in, in values. Um, and I call this one freedom. This is, I painted this during um, the election cycle and I just close her eyes and I think I was trying to say a lot about inner peace. And that's one of the places where you can actually achieve um, ultimate freedom. Um, you can see through her body language is very closed off and her eyes are closed. And I hope that um, I kind of achieved what I wanted to say in this painting. So self-portraits are a way for me to kind of step back, have some self-reflection and I can always uh, kind of see where I am in my life whether something's going really good or really bad, I always try to take the time to memorialize um, really specific periods in my life. So um, in this painting, in this drawing, I used to study for, for a painting, but I was um, newly married. I kind of had a lot of responsibilities. Uh, the art thing was kind of taken off, but it wasn't exactly you know, super sustainable in 2005. Uh, so this, this expression, um, of a younger me, um, you can kind of see where I'm hopeful and optimistic, but at the same time, a little reticent on, you know, what the future really holds uh, for me out there. And this, this painting is years later. So um, I call this one American Dream. So at this time, uh, in 2018, I was coming up on, um, not yet separated in my marriage, but kind of feeling the replications, uh, ramifications of uh, 14 years of, of marriage and how people sometimes grow apart um, and what all that means. And also uh, the American dream, you know, with a question mark almost, you know, I have the, the tattered flag there. I have the, uh, the New York Yankee baseball hat, hat which represents um, America's pastime. Um, and then I have a house that I own on the Jersey Shore in the background, so I'm a homeowner as well. But if you look at my face, you can also see um, that there's a little bit of, um, of a question mark there. You know, it's not sad, it's not doom and gloom, but um, it's not all sunny and optimistic. So in my work, I like to tell I like to tell stories, and I like to use myself um, in a lot of these stories. So this is ticket booth. So I've painted more than a few ticket booths. So in New Jersey, we have to pay uh, to gain access to the beach, and I, that's a very American thing as well. Um, so I put these these big obstructions um, right there, just as a Kind of a little bit of an essay just just to ask the question you know why and I always ask myself you know because I am caught up in a lot of the um the trappings of you know who can live 
who can live where, who can have access to what. So I took um, one of my favorite models. This is Lexi um, out to the beach on the off season. Um, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a luxury to live on the, on the beach and have beach access and I have to pay in the off season. And, you know, this is right around November and there's no one out there, um, but she's got her back to the ocean. You know, it's almost like a, a, she's, she's, she's doing it, but there's a little bit of a protest. Uh, and they've since tore all these ticket booths down. So I'm glad that I've painted it and memorialize a few of them. So this is another beach scene, which um, there's a lot of emotion running through, running through this and I'm not gonna really go through the whole thing, but there's, uh, there's a big, big story about this one, but this is one of my favorite places to paint in Point Pleasant Beach. Um, I just love the jetties, I love all the feet there uh, and just just the way the ocean comes in and, and, and crashes up against uh, those man-made articles there is just absolutely amazing it's it's so loud it's like thunder just constantly crashing over there so I put her very still in that moment but there's no way you can be over there and be still because there's water and ocean spray going everywhere so this is the same model this is Maisie uh, so we spent the weekend uh, together trying to compile a little bit of a, a story, like a vacation uh, story. So she was kind of undressing and dressing for a, a nude composition I was doing inside. Uh, and I went outside to take a call and I turned around and this is actually, uh, I think she was tying her hair back or something. And I just, just got more inspired by this than what I was actually doing when I, before I came outside. Um, so, um, my friend Victoria Wyatt actually named this one half open. She likes the, the play on words. Again, this is, I went from the off season to now the models facing the ocean and kind of embracing, um, all those good vibes, all those good feelings that the ocean and summer can actually give you. So in Point Pleasant, I like to take walks. So this is this is just literally one of my walking pieces, and I like the fact that um, over near where the uh, the fishermen uh, take the boats out um, on the jetty, there there could be a, a broken broken down boat right out the side of the street, you know, um, and it's propped up on a pickup truck, you know, and <laughs> I, I think this is more like a still life when I look at this composition. You know, everything's right there on top of each other. You know, you have that pyramid in the middle of the uh, of the composition, and and I just like the way this little scene looked when I was when I was walking. Uh, so I just I just had to capture it. So I call this spirit on Channel Drive. So I have in the front end, you know, a lot of my. Um, my relatives and, and family friends and, you know, people that have had a very different life than I've been fortunate enough to have. So when I do still lifes like this or, or seascapes, um, whatever you feel about this, it's, it's simple, um, but it's honest. You know, I do take walks around the ocean, I ride my cruiser, um, sometimes I park it and sit and just meditate and just hang out. So um, I just had to paint a portrait of my bike. And I just, there's not much to say. I just love that architecture. Uh, I love the white um, of some of these whitewashed buildings. Um, I love everything about the American flag being a veteran. Um, and I saw this scene and it just absolutely captivated me. Um, and this is, this is where the, the um, lifeguards congregate. So right in, in the opening right there, you can see the refrigerator. Um, they have the rules for the shack written out there. Um, and this is one of the days when there was a uh, pretty rough sea. So that's what the yellow um, flag is. It has a, a skeleton on it. 
So my friend across the street is what we call a clam digger. A clam digger is a person that has lived locally all his life and then his parents lived there all their lives and then their grandparents lived there all, all their lives. So Kevin's, uh, my neighbor is a clam digger. And what he likes to do is um, carve these, these decoys and enter them into to contests and sell them at galleries. And we were just hanging out one day and um, I just kept staring at these decoys. And I like the unfinished ones more than I like the finished ones. You know, it shows the artist's hand, it shows his interest and all these, these pet projects that he has. Um, and I also love how, <laughs> like the one in the back with the, with the yellow beak, uh, there's actually some personality in some of these, these decoys. I mean, they're lifeless, but he's trying to actually mimic uh, you know the gestures in the body language of some of these some of these uh these birds um I, and i just i just captivated by it because i paint living birds <laughs> but i never painted a wooden a decoy and i was just trying to mimic all the texture and everything in the wood and i just had a lot of fun he let me set up in there and prop my watercolors up and, and paint in his shed so it was a lot of fun so oftentimes my work gets compared to Andrew Wyeth and um, I think that's, a, that's, that's fair. Um, in 1995, I was stumbling through a, a library in Huntsville, Alabama after doing the pastels um, for a few years. And I was just looking for inspiration, you know? And I was in a reference section. I went all the way from the A to the B, all the way down, I got to the W's and I had really never heard of Andrew Wyeth until 1995. Um, then I just started looking through the books and I, I just love the texture. I love the people he was painting. I grew up, uh, left Oklahoma at the age of 11. So I, I was very familiar with barns and horses and rolling landscapes. And that's what he was painting mostly um, in Chatsford. And then I moved to the Jersey shore and he also was painting oceans uh, and lighthouses in Maine. So he brought together um, my two worlds and I was really fortunate to stumble upon his work. And uh, so I'm gonna go through a couple of images um, and these are not derivative at all, but I just love the cross pollinization of, of our work. So this is that church that I painted my, my relatives uh, on the right side is where a lot of them were posed. Um, and I lived behind this church on the left. Uh, so you can kind of see, I'm, I'm not sure if Andrew White was religious, but he would use architecture in his work. And uh, it just so happens, uh, and I had not seen this paint, painting or anything he's done of churches, but uh, I just absolutely love this church. So this is George, this is a gentleman I met while I was teaching in Mississippi. Um, and he just had a, a random t-shirt from someone's reunion. Uh, and that's the one thing that got me going. And this kicked off a whole series of George uh, and I've painted him dozens of times, but this is absolutely one of my favorites because it's when I really started getting to know this gentleman, he's a it's a sketch artist and he paints, uh, draws in ballpoint pen and hangs on McDonald's and paints and draws people. And he's just a really gentle, loving individual. So I put this image, this is one of my favorite uh, Andrew Wyeth paintings from his Close Friends series. Um, and I just, I just can't get enough of uh, the regular, I hate this term, but everyday people that he that he paints, and that was the spirit that I brought to my work. So I was, it was refreshing to see him kind of highlight some of these same kind of characters. So this is one of my pastels um, of a gentleman that um, was pushing cans down the street in a carriage in uh, in South Carolina.
as a veteran, of course, this is just a beautiful tempera. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And this is my watercolor of Sergeant Jacobs. She was singing at a Martin Luther King uh, birthday celebration. And uh, she was serving on the same base that my mom had worked at as a civilian. Uh, and uh, we had a discussion and she was trying to kind of get her mind ready to um, get out of the army and merge and blend into uh, civilian life. And I just thought it was fascinating. She had sung a beautiful uh, song with her mom at the ceremony. Uh, <laughs> and then I was talking to her and realized that she had this green eyeshadow, eye makeup on matching it with her uniform. And uh, that started the conversation. And she told me that she was, you know, really itching to get out and wear makeup and regular cl civilian clothes and everything. And that, that was the impetus to, to this painting. And that's the end. That's where I'm going to end it. So um, thank you guys for hanging with me and looking at my work and being here tonight. You could have been anywhere, but I do really do appreciate um, everyone that, that came and listened to the things that I had to say tonight. And again, thank you for, to Dan Thompson and uh, the good people at Studio and Kaminati. I really appreciate uh, you having me tonight. So thank you. Mary, your work is just so powerful and there's so many amazing things to say about it. And you've gotten an overwhelming reaction from everybody who's been here tonight. And um, I wonder if we could explore a couple of things. I feel like being the MC and you being the master, uh, what I should do is ask everybody else's questions before I ask my own. So let me do that. <laughs> sure. Of course. Aside from, aside from heaps of praise, deservedly so, uh, there was a question about your, he said, how did Mario develop his sense of composition, especially so early in his career, such as the second portrait of Oscar and Plum? Mm. Oh, well, well, I appreciate the question. And, and um, yeah, I, um, when it, when it comes to composition, I think I developed it from um, being scared to, to paint. I drew for years upon years. When I got into the talented and gifted program at, in sixth grade, all I did was draw. And that's how I got accepted to Pratt Institute um, on, a draw, uh, on a full scholarship. It was maybe 12 drawings. And I think that allowed me to uh, kind of see things uh, a little bit more linear, a little bit more clean um, before I got to the painting uh, process. So it might, it might be um, also the way I see the world, maybe through a, a, a smaller lens, because I, I was always by myself. Um, and um, I think just a lot of drawing was the thing that actually enabled me to see things a little bit clearly um, and put them uh, on the page the way I actually do. I understand. Um, the, uh, I wonder if it's a the right time for me to begin asking some of my own questions because it is as opposed to segueing into material concerns i'm just struck by your facial expressions particularly the one of your your grandma in the fur coat and, and i'm always getting you know into the facial expression as a as a learned kind of skill with people mm. and they present me with with certain things uh and i i in turn present them with certain things Yes. One of those is a kind of seminal series of facial expressions, happiness, sadness, fear, uh, mm -hmm. disgust, you know, from Ekman and whatnot. But you seem mm -hmm. to have captured dignity mm -hmm. as it, almost a, like an inner presence, if not a facial expression. I'm just wondering how you did that. Thank you. Uh, and coming from you, Dana, that's 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 a huge compliment. I am. Um, my grandmother lost her speech with, with the stroke as well. Um, so her eyes were super expressive. She could mumble things and kind of try to get us to understand 
when she said our names or or pointing at things, but her um, you can almost see how how stiff and rigid her mouth is, um, and then and then the eyes are almost the only thing she has other than her one hand. Um, so she leaned on that really hard. So this one is um, I wouldn't say cheating, but it 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 allowed me to to have things to to really hone in on and uh, and and exaggerate and um, you know I think to your point uh, each one of us has a very distinct um, characteristic um, especially when we animate ourselves and when I listen to people when I when I observe people I look at their body language and I I, I do try to find an entryway into uh, what makes this person interesting? What what makes them tick? Um, and I'm just so fortunate to have people interesting to me to want to to want to paint. Before I moved on to to strangers, um, I knew so much about this woman. I knew everything about uh, what would set her off. What would uh, she was very emotional, a very territorial person because she had been in the nursing home for thirty years. Um, so sitting in those rooms with her, uh, some of the drawings um, kind of set the stage for this. Um, and unfortunately, you know, Dan, as an artist, you know this, there's so much uh, dignity and struggle, um, so much overcoming when you when you when when there's pain and lack. Um, so the models, the people, the subjects that, that have been patient enough to let me into their world, let me take some of their time away um, are the real stars because they they set, set the stage based on how they live their lives and the things that they've done to let me come in and, and try to find something to something interesting to say to 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 give to people. And I think watercolor just to close it up allows for a lot of that transit, that fluid kind of um, application. So it's not just a stiff um, homage to the artist and, and my technique. Um, it's a little bit out of my hands as well. Um, so it really allows the subject to shine rather than me uh, just showing off some fancy techniques. Okay, that's a perfect, speaking of segues, because it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong at all, but uh, so much of what you've alluded to in your presentation has been that a portrait is a kind of honorarium in and of itself that you you, you celebrate the individual, which makes the piece more about the person that you are intending to honor and um, kind of celebrate than, than it is about the artist. And you just, mm -hmm. you just said that thing about showing off. That mm -hmm. How much do you feel that? And how has that affected the treatment of the portraits that you have created over your career so far? Uh, it, it, you know, when, when I talk for this almost hour, you know, I, I like to, I like to just keep it on the stories, the, a little bit of the, the, the biography, um, and I can go even further with it. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to be appropriate in the moment and just give enough background, you know, whether it's what drew me to the person or who the person is. And I think um, painting as a vehicle, um, and I, I, I love mastery. I love um, reaching higher, higher levels um, of understanding and technique um, and growing. Uh, me, I like to, I'm, I'm really more interested in the, in, in the person or the place. Um, so I wanna tell enough of that story um, as I can in a comprehensive way without obsessing and having pressure on myself to um, you know make it perfect um, but to the prior question I think an interesting composition um, is mostly what I'm after um, when I'm trying to tell the story that's more more so than the technique um, is the composition and how I can make it interesting because I am painting strangers at the end of the day to other people um, so that that's 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 the <laughs> And and the further I went, Dan, I, I realized that I did have to make it more and more and more and more interesting, um, and not and sometimes make the the subject the keynote 
Um, but at other times, if they, if they have too strong of a personality or, or something, you know, take them out or put them in the corner or um, put a lot of other things around them. And I can talk a lot about composition um, and how to convince someone that they should be looking at something that they don't want to be looking at. I know this is a very, I have images of my grandmother even harder to look at. I have one entitled Grandmother's Room where she has a, a blue sweatshirt on and she has a pillow kind of to the side and she, she's about 10 years older than this. And one of my friends was like, why would you paint that? And I'm like, why wouldn't I paint that? Um, this is what she did with her life and to herself. Mm. And this is the person I love. I don't have another person to replace her with. Mm. Mm. God, that's powerful. The, when you're painting somebody though, you have so much of an experience with, so much of a history with, and so much love for, mm -hmm. it makes it, you know, it just makes it a lot more, more intricate to try to, um, to kind of sift through all these memories and, and all these experiences and, and make an image which is emblematic, you know. Um, you know, the image you make is going to be so personal to you. And you did say that fascinating thing a second ago that, it, that whoever you paint, is a stranger to everybody else, but eventually the the person becomes a stranger to everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And um and, and I, I suppose the effort is to, to create an image where you feel enough of an association to the person as though you knew her or him, right? So that you can yes. look back through the ages and connect with that person. Yes. And and I think that. You know, when I'm painting, because I, I have a whole series, not only of my dad, of my mom, I have multiples of my mom before she had her aneurysm uh, about 10 years ago. Some of those prior images of her when she was healthy are, are hard to hard to look at. Um, but to answer, pick up on that point, you know, whether it's a mom, whether it's a grandmother, whether it's a father, an aunt, these themes are universal. Um, they're going to age, they're going to lose a step. Um, they're, they're here now and they might be gone tomorrow, you know, but we all have these, these, these bonds, these, these relationships. Um, so this might be my grandmother, but it could be anybody's um, grandmother who doesn't have her youth anymore. Um, and I think that's, that's the thing that, um, gets these portraits through the door and hangs on, on people's walls. It's not about me. It's not about um, my grandmother, the person. It's if I painting in a, paint it in a loving way, in an honest way, um, there's got to be some, some connection. And I don't have, I don't own any. The only one I own is grandmother's room, which I won't sell, but I've sold multiple of sketches, this painting. I, I've sold all of them of my grandmother, which is a hard painting to look at. She's not a glamour model. But I think that universal theme binds us all together, and it's it's it says more uh, about us than I think we know. You know, it crosses it crosses race, it crosses uh, ageism. It's for this to hang in someone's home in the dining room, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it goes to to the notion of of real beauty with a capital B as opposed to prettiness. You know, that beauty is a more profound thing, deeply mm -hmm. felt and experienced. Um, 100%, 100%. May, I, may I ask you um, to, to bring in some of the other questions that were uh, brought up during your presentation? Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned um, mourning at Altus, calling the galleries mm -hmm. uh, about the unveiling of, of a new series of watercolors where you were going to change your medium and they were not quite enthusiastic. Uh, is yes. part of what is part of what motivated you to change your medium, this search for a deeper meaning um, in terms of how you were penetrating the image for lack of a better phrase, how you were, how you were able to connect what you, you felt you needed to portray? And what was it that made you do that? And what sorts of pushback did you get from the galleries? Mm -hmm. um, I, I needed, I, I, I loved watercolors inside. I uh, ran across Andrew Wyatt's work in, in multiple of books in 1995. And I saw that there was an expansion of um, composition that I needed to, to, to implement in my work. Um, 
with the with the pastels, I was doing such a labor intensive. Um, these cross this, this right here, this this took me three months to do every seven days a week. Uh, you know, this took me my whole summer um, for a little over four months. So to, so to to expand that, to broaden that out and paint um, skies and um, houses and uh, you can look at the pastels and see that there's there's just a, a, a limit this this took almost six months and it's you know it's every inch has to be cared after it has to be um, layered and uh, it was it was burning me out a little bit it was taking a toll on my on my hands on my um, I got carpal tunnel because I'm ambidextrous in both both hands. Um, my back, I was reeking of icy hot because um, I was just slathering it on and people could smell me a mile away. And I did this for 10 years and um, there were a lot that I wanted to reach when it came to um, capturing light outdoors. I wanted to paint more outside. Um, if you look at the work, 90% of it, 99% of it is outdoors. Um, so I needed to be a little bit more economical with my time. This, this painting took me six days um, and I could paint my dad on location. I could get out more and uh, have that direct um, uh, interaction with the people that I was painting. They're not, they're not art models. They're not gonna sit there and come back and take 20, 20 minute uh, sessions and five minute breaks. I, it, it freed me to, uh, to really get after things and be outdoors more. Um, and then ultimately on the technical side, take advantage of, of the light that watercolor offers. Um, the whites are more crisp and clean in the work now. And on the pushback, um, I think introducing anything new, Dan, is always going to be met with a little bit of um, ret reticency. And um, the gallery was, was, was successful at painting all the, uh, selling all the pastels I was bringing through the door. Um, but the early, to be honest, the early watercolors weren't as good. Um, so that kind of turns over the apple cart when it comes to economics as well. Um, so from 2005, uh, after that sold out show, we had sold out shows all the way up until the economic turndown in 2008, you know, 2005, mm. six, seven, and ultimately eight was the last really big show in Charleston, but we couldn't keep the watercolors after they got better. <laughs> it was incumbent upon me also. I've been painting pastels for 10 years and painting watercolor for three years at that point. Um, yeah, they just weren't that good, to be honest. So uh, this goes to another question. The, the painting you did here of your dad was done on location uh, would you have reference because he's not a professional model at all? Uh, some photo imagery for it while you're on location? Yes. So the only the only thing that that is from the reference is his head and hand. Okay. Um, my dad is like tall than me. He's like six four, mm -hmm. six five, and really wiry and antsy. Um, so I tried it initially. You know, because I was bringing my bad studio habits to it. So I was taping off his hand, trying to get him back in the pose. And then eventually, you know, he wouldn't get into it. So, so I was like, and he's a gunslinger. So he's all paranoid. He's got all kinds of stuff going on in the local community. He's looking around. So I had to get the reference for the head and the hands and everything else. I could stand out there in this abandoned um, building, this field, and get it um, and chase the light down as it moved, but um, yeah, I can get everything from life. And that's that's how I use um, the reference with a lot of these people. Same thing here. I could just get him in there, get the drawing down, get the feel going, um, and then get him as uh, the reference, you know? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And then while we're on the topic of that, you, you mentioned there were several pieces you talked about the watercolor living under the pastel, and then mm -hmm. your then your technique uh, shifts to uh, watercolor in tempera. Would you talk a little bit about the transition and what you would do regarding technical 
attributes and technical like lessons learned and how it shifted your thinking about medium and medium control? Sure. Yes. So this is one of the final ones um, that have that that hybrid um, quality. So this is when I figured out um, that you cannot, the way I was trying to deliver my watercolors, you cannot get value relationships, proper value relationships through color, with watercolor. So it only gets hotter and hotter and hotter as you try to darken things, just, let's just say in the eye sockets. Um, that has to be established with value underneath. So it has to be a muted color that cancels, colors that cancel each other out. So when I first started, I was mixing burnt sienna and Payne's gray. Payne's gray and watercolor has black in it. So it was um, mixing with the burnt sienna. It was giving me a warm blackish mess underneath my watercolors. Then I moved to what I use now as a burnt umber and, and French ultramarine blue, which gives me those grays that you can kind of see on the left side of his hair. Um, it's like a mousy gray. So I would take that all the way through my mid-tones, um, the darks, and establish a full value range underneath my watercolors before I put color over top of it. So then I wouldn't have to use the pastel to, uh, to smooth things out um, and to get the proper values that I wanted and to put you know appropriate color um, because the face is all pretty much pastel. Even, even the glint, the highlight on his forehead, I would have to go back and reverse engineer it and build uh, from a mid-tone in the, in the pastel stage to a highlight because I couldn't just put white over that. I had to build the chroma, the, the, uh, the actual flesh tone. So I was kind of stepping on my own foot. So um, I just had to take a step back, stop cheating and work um, through those, those value relationships with watercolor. And this was the last one, the hybrid that I did. This was 2004 um, that I stopped doing that. And because I really didn't like the look of it. it, it ended up turning out being a pastel anyway, because of all the cross hatching on top of it that you see is, <laughs> it was just a safe way to play it. And in art, you have to take risks. You, <laughs> even if the naysayers are saying, stop doing this, it's wrong, it's not that good. You have to actually stop what you're doing if you're not pleased, as good as it looks, and um, follow your artistic voice. And, um, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm much, much happier. I'm not doing pastel. I might do one once every five or six years. Right, right. It, now, um, uh, someone was asking about the paper and whether or not it, within the course of this evolution, you had to do anything special with your substrate, with your paper, uh, with any kind of an additive onto the paper, onto the surface to uh, allow the pastel or the watercolor to attach it here or bite the, the texture of it differently? No, I didn't. No, I didn't have to do anything to it because I was working with the uh, the pastels all on watercolor paper. Um, the only thing I would have to do is what I would have to do anyway if I was working with the watercolor is is stretch the paper, just put it in a, a tub and you know let it dry and let it let it uh, expand and contract and tape it down. But I wouldn't have to do anything to the surface um, at all. Um, the watercolor is such a flat medium; it lives down in the teeth of, of the watercolor paper. Um, there was no interruption at all, and I'm not a big blender, so I wouldn't have to blend over the watercolor at all. Um, yeah, so no, you just don't have to do anything; just paint, just paint. I love that about the watercolor living in the teeth of the fiber of the paper. That's, that's yeah, crazy. it just stains it. It just lives down in there, and the pastel um, comes over top of it and you know, it, 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 it just takes up a little bit of tooth so you can kind of feel it when you're applying the pastel because uh, the tooth is already, there's already something kind of, it's like if you sit in a seat and someone's already sitting there, you, you're going to be sitting on their lap. So that, that's kind of the feeling that I was getting when I was working with the pastel over the watercolor. It was already something kind of in the tooth of it. So you can feel it graze over that, that, um, 
that tooth, but um, it, it, there's, there's no difference. You don't have to prepare. And I'm not a big preparation guy. Mm. You know, I'm, I don't, I don't like the gessoing of, of oils and I, I don't like, I don't care for it. So you know, it wouldn't have interested me to have to paint something for four or five months and then have to do all that preparation to um, just wouldn't have worked for me. I have a question as well about this. You called, and I don't think it was in the painting here of Charles Jones, but one of them you called, quote, an exercise in values. This doesn't look like an exercise in values to me. Um, this reminds me of a conversation that we've been having with Sam Adequately about World Skin Tones Day, where we were meeting with him about the celebration of, of the diaspora of skin tones around the world, which we're going to mm -hmm. take part in on this coming Saturday. And he says, mm -hmm. he says, Dan, it's not about race. It's about skin tones, it's about mm -hmm. beautiful coloration and skin. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that, please? Yeah, I was thinking about that early, you know, because some people take use their art. I never wanted to use my art for, you know, any kind of cheap kind of statement or 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 as a way um, of 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 kind of separating my art out from the broader conversation of of of, um, of art. It, it so when I approach a, a piece, I'm not I'm not thinking. You know, here this is a black man. This is a young black girl. It, when I'm going through it, I have the same issues, the same problems uh, that I do when I paint lighter flesh. It's 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 just um, the, the thing with African American flesh tones, though, is you really have to control the chroma, the warmth of 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 what's going to live on top of it, because a lot of times it gets too warm. You know, it gets it gets you know. There's, there's a lot of Sienna, there's, a, you know, but it, it's cooler than people think, I, I would just say. Um, when I look at other paintings um, of African-American people, it has a tendency just, I think a lot of times as artists too, and I'm stubborn in this way, I'll see something and, and just make a quick judgment. Oh, I got it. You know, it's like, uh, there's pink notes in it. All right. But you... <laughs> If you look a little bit deeper, you might find that there's some nuance in there. There's some cools and forms that are playing off from each other. And uh, you really just have to put that in there. But sometimes we we just, our rational minds make make up our minds for us and we're chasing this, you know? Um, so it, it really is, no, it's not about um, race. And that's the liberating part about painting. Um, you are just there with a subject. With a soul, um, yeah. That's it. Even with my dad, that's why we kind of bonded and got a little closer during that five five year period. Was uh, I was just trying to get it right and express a lot of the things that um, that were living in me that were unresolved as a young person that had all these questions that that weren't answered. And he was just a a, a, a person in front of me that I was really trying to uh, to capture on my on my paper. Um, and it was just like an unspoken. I think sometimes words are cheap. So we really didn't have to, to speak a lot um, during those periods. And it really allowed us to have uh, a bond, a partnership um, around the paintings. And as they went into magazines and, and other things on newsstands, um, he was able to have that appreciation for what I actually did and really, you know, like not have his time wasted because I had him in some precarious <laughs> Feels and situations that he want, didn't want to be in. <laughs> so that's what I would say about flesh tones. It's just people. All right. All right. So that, that being said, then I have to ask you this. Being the, in this amazing meditative state of, in, in the sense of a student of nature as you are, what makes a great model? What, what you know, you mentioned painting Plum between 1996 and 2008. You mentioned mm -hmm. painting George dozens of times. I know Maisie. Maisie's amazing too. Um, yes. Is it is it kind of the initial visual sense that um, heralds uh, the uh, inquiry about their life, and you find out more about them? Is it their life story that starts making them into into a model, kind of a uh, not only a model but a kind of subject incarnate, where you can tell stories about universal themes through their 
their imagery? What makes a great model? What makes somebody want you to paint them for 12 years? Mm, that's man, that's 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 a great question and come from you that you know that's not surprising because you're a deep thinker. Um yeah, so I was a very shy um preteen and teen uh, before I discovered that I could draw and express myself that way. Um before I even get to the look, most of my models um are a little bit less um they're not extroverts so i'm not with people a lot um it's an immediate thing where if i feel comfortable with the person um, they put me at ease i gotta know more about this person like charles his voice is very whispery very very unassuming uh you know Maisie. Maisie is is the same way and a lot of the people plum she's just over there in the corner it's like was plum even here that could be one of those things. And I see myself in all of these people. <laughs> so I'm identifying that trait and a lot of times using those people to, to kind of express the things that I want to express um, and say something and kind of, it sounds kitsch, but a lot of more self portraits, putting myself in these places through these people. Um, and then ultimately the self portraits are the ultimate expression of that. Um, that lonely kid that just really didn't really fit into any tribe or group um, that is really able to express himself in such a solemn, um, solemn way. Um, and then the look does have to have something appealing to it. Like um, a lot of the older people are stand-ins for my own family members and, and people that I were close to like Oscar, he could be a stand-in for a grandfather that I really was never really close to because of alcoholism. Um, and the people around the church, um, they were all nurturing souls. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a combination of, of things, but I'm always rooting for the underdog, like the painting, the, the series of my grandmother um, and elevating her to a place where people would just walk over and not really wanna be bothered, um, makes me happy. That's, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that, that, that person that's, that's a little bit um, off the beaten path, mm -hmm. person that's not often celebrated. And I'm not just that person to actually be dumb enough to wanna paint that person and give them the, give them the spotlight. So a lot of my, my paintings uh, are about the underdog as well. Do you think that off the beaten path might be a better way of putting it than I think the what you had said was ordinary, or um, you said it wasn't a good phrase. Everyday, Everyday people. people. Yeah. 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 Because we all are that, right? Um, yeah. Um, people, especially in art, I think, I think art, especially in the later, like this contemporary era, like a lot of these paintings weren't, I couldn't post them to, to Instagram because it didn't exist. Um, I wasn't doing it for likes and comments and everything. Um, I was doing it, I am still doing it for myself um, and the people that I'm close to. Uh, and I think the pressure to paint pretty things, paint things that are gonna be readily accepted, uh, are, it, it's, it's tempting. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an allure to that, you know? Um, and I, I, it's eye candy, and it's nothing wrong with it. It's it's just um, what what I'm what I'm interested in. What I'm wanting to celebrate is um, I'm not just out there just mining and looking for uh, people that that aren't on the cover of Vogue. But it just it just so happens that the, the people that I've been exposed to in my circles um, and have nurtured me are. Um, People that get up and just go to work every day and just don't have a silver spoon uh, in their mouths. So um, it was a risk too. I'm not going to sit here and be like, uh, well, yeah, that's what the magazines wanted. That's what um, the galleries wanted. That's what the collector, that's what everybody wants is um, my um, handicapped grandmother. These things have to, they're not one-offs, you know, Dan, they're, 
I had to prove this point over and over and stick to it and stand on that square. And a lot of times it was an island. I mean, Dean Mitchell was painting his grandmother. He was he was kind of like a pre predecessor to me by 10 years. Um, you know, but he would also paint the architecture and a lot of other things. And I just really kept driving that that point home um, with these 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 wonderful, amazing um, people, Americans. You know, and I've met Dean. He's a, he's a mm -hmm. tremendous guy, tremendous painter. Is he part of the sort of the inspiration side? Because we do have a question about how long did it take you to realize that painting the personal portraiture was the path that you wanted to explore? Hmm. I would say, um, I think even when I mentioned Andrew Wyeth and the things he was painting and the way he was approaching it was more of an affirmation. Um, I was like in the middle of painting Oscar, the one with the plaid shirt, um, before I even went over to the library and got introduced to Andrew Wyeth. So you can see where my soul, my approach, um, it already it was already going in that direction. And Dean as well is just an affirmation of a kindred spirit. Um, so seeing Dean's work, uh, it, it was refreshing. I think the first time I saw it was on the cover of American Artists in 2000. He had an image of a woman with a shower cap on and she was fishing um, in a boat. And I just couldn't believe uh, the beauty that he had garnered and that they had put it on the cover. And that gave me another boost. Um, Cause that was, yeah, that was 2000. And I'd already painted all those plums. I painted Oscar. And as you can see, I was, I was kind of hitting the ground running before I'd even uh, saw Dean's work. And it just gave me a, a level of inspiration and um, kind of like a, like a, you ever get those kind of, um, affirmations. It's like, okay, Dan, you're on the right track. You know, it could be anything, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's kind of what Dean was. Um, and our, our work is, I always laugh because our work is so different. <laughs> and people always, even two days ago, you must know Dean Mitchell. They looked at my work. I'm like, I know Dean Mitchell. I know I know, I know Dan, I, I know Grimaldi, I, I know Jacob Kyle. It's like, you must know Dean. It's like, it, our work is so different. It's unbelievable, but similar, I guess. Well, sometimes you get those, you know, just, just kind of, um, you know, make conversation comments. For you know, sure. You don't know quite what to say. Um, I, I, I think some of that is probably they're just bowled over by your work and, and they want to hear you speak to it. I hope and, so. You know, sometimes you say a lot more by saying not much verbally, but a lot visually, you know. Thank you. So, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. That's where we are, Dan. We're in this, you know, social media, um, you know, comments. You feel like compelled to have to comment and talk so much about it in an unofficial capacity. Um, work, hopefully, is saying way more than I could ever um, say and justify. I. I just have so much fun uh, painting and, and, and putting these, these characters out there. It, it is, you know, it is, I, I couldn't imagine have ever have done anything other than this. It, I, I just don't know a life without this. Um, and it's conversational. It really is. It's these people are, um, there's something else. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't include any of my mom cause I only have a certain amount of, you know, time to steal away from you guys because that really would got me on a tangent so i intentionally didn't <laughs> didn't put her in any of these paintings well mm. what, what this does is it opens up an opportunity to invite you personally to come to the school next time and talk about your mom and bring those images with you so you can visit the studios and yes and talk to everybody and and yes. take some personal questions from uh from our student body from our creative community i love to so that I would be wonderful to. may I, I ask you one more I want to ask one more question. You've been so generous with your time. Um, sure. The title of your of your presentation tonight: "Portraits in the American Tradition." And mm -hmm. I, it may be an unfair question because your work embodies a kind of search for timelessness and and 
the use of portraiture to ennoble humanity. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit to what the American tradition is or, or, or how your work embodies it or it embodies your search a little bit, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Um, I think starting with, um, when, when you talk about the American tradition, um, art history in general has not been, you know, really kind to um, African subjects, African-American subjects. Um, there's been kind of like a, uh, a caricature version of it. Andrew Wyeth even mentioned um, that in one of his books, and he, even, he says he, he's not sure if he's done a great job of it either, but he's, he's tried to humanize the, uh, the figures um, and, and put them in, in less um, uh, images of servitude and, and, and sometimes even buffoonery. Um, and Winslow Homer, the same. There's, there's some paintings in the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, in the American wing that actually speak to this, this very thing. There's, there's one, I think it's called A Day of the Parade. Um, it's a celebratory uh, image, multi-figure image. Um, and, uh, you know, Tanner as well. So when you start talking about American artists who actually turned the century um, in the 19th century and started placing African-Americans in, in a more human uh, role with, with, with more sensibility and respect, um, that's the wing of the American tradition that I'm chasing. Um, and then you have the, just the images, just being an American, taking it away from that part, um, painting outdoors, painting the American landscape, painting our beaches, um, using watercolor, which is such an American, thanks to Winslow Homer, the father of American watercolor, um, such an American medium. Um, and I think a lot of times our divisions get the best of us. I am just another um, artist in a big diaspora of, of American painters. You know, so putting myself in in that um, that argument, um, you know, is 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 what I need to be doing. I don't need to be putting myself in some kind of a niche or a corner. Um, I'm painting these these peoples people that are legitimate Americans um, in an American way, in, in an American realistic um, style, unapologetically. So that's why I named it. Um, name tonight's presentation, Portraits in the American Tradition. It's a fascinating concept because it, tradition uh, looks to history, but of course we're talking about the future because we're alive and we're gonna make work tomorrow and work next week and work next mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. And we're continuing a tradition that will change by our very contributions to it. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I'm glad you mentioned Homer the father of American watercolor painting and, yeah. and Tanner and, and so much of what needs to be addressed to, to make it uh, much more wholesome, comprehensive and, and mm -hmm. broad-minded in aesthetically and in terms of what we're all trying to do with our work. So quite a, an excellent answer. Absolutely, thank, thank you, thank you. Yes, I, just to close it up, you know, Dan, you know, when I talked to you, um, you're really smart, and we we always have really um, good conversations, even if they're brief, you know. And there's a there's a mutual uh, respect and, and camaraderie, and I think you have such an open mind and an open heart. Uh, two people, plural, um, gets us um, individually um, closer to the mark that I think we're all pressing for. Uh, so you're a great example of that ecumenical. Um, uh, way of being in the world. And that's what I hope um, and aspire to, you know, what when it comes to individuals and what they're going through and what they're struggling with, um, being able to see the human spirit, the humanity in people. Um, I think that's the thing that, um, that we should be actually focusing on. All the other stuff is, is, is just distraction, personally speaking. I couldn't agree more. And you said it, spirit. That's it. Yeah. That's what we are. Yes. Totally intangible, ethereal, and yes. yet, you know, unique. So thank you. I mean, that's the perfect way to close out tonight's extraordinary conversation with you. And um, again, I think everybody is is uh, clapping, even though they're muted right now, <laughs> for 
uh, your amazing uh, talk that you gave us tonight. You gave us so much, and uh, I cannot thank you enough for doing so. And I, I also consider you a great friend, and uh, look forward Likewise. to our our conversations in the near future. Likewise. And and, uh, and again, uh, really appreciate you doing this for us and for our community. And I hope you come down in person in the very near future as well. Absolutely, I'm there. I'm there. All right. All right. Thank Excellent. You, man. Well, thank you all so much again for being part of tonight's Bennett Schmidt Lecture on the Hiring of Art with Mario Robinson. I hope you'll check out his work. I think if you do a search on his work, uh, you can find it quite easily. And um, please continue the conversation. Stay in touch with us. And by all means, join us this coming weekend and next month when we um, talk to a few other like-minded creative folks uh, who inspire us in, in all myriad uh, kinds of ways. Um, and we'll talk to you later, okay?